Education is the key that unlocks opportunity and innovation of the human spirit. The next doctor or teacher, the next scientist curing disease, the next business leader rolling back climate change will have had a quality education. Education unlocks the solution to environmental and health challenges. It unlocks economic growth, peace and security. But to unlock education, we need to unlock big change. And that is what their world is working to achieve every day. Even before the coronavirus, we were in the midst of a global education crisis. Before, there were 260 million children not in school. Now millions more may never make it back. There are at least 175 million children who are not in early education, the time when 90% of the brain develops. And for so many who are in school, their education is sadly substandard. At Their World, we have already made our mark over the past decade, backing double shift schools for Syrian refugees, supporting the Safe Schools Initiative after the Chibok girls were abducted, piloting inclusive early childhood education for children with disabilities, bringing coding and skills clubs to girls across Africa and the Middle East. But we don't want to stop there. At Their World, we are ambitious. We're here to end the global education crisis and give every child the best start in life. COVID-19 makes that task even more challenging as education could look very different for years to come. We have reacted quickly to the pandemic. In Kenya and Nigeria, we held workshops to help teachers move their classes online. In Uganda, our partners went door to door to reach children left out of school. In Lebanon, students received materials to learn at home. COVID means it's more important than ever for us to produce innovative ideas and projects and then scale them up across whole countries and continents to find the next breakthrough, whether through our research or working behind the scenes and to build a movement for the next generation with our global youth ambassadors at its heart alongside civil society, our global business coalition for education, governments and philanthropy. We are campaigning for all governments and donors to spend much more on early years education. We also want every refugee child in school. And we want the biggest investment in education history we want education to be the key to rebuilding, at the centre where it belongs. We want to unlock big change, and we want to do it together with you. Join us at theirworld.org. A quality education is the key to unlocking a child's potential. And that should never be a game of chance. But for the millions of children currently locked out of school, education is like the roll of a dice. So if education is the key to a brighter future, what happens if you're one of the lucky ones? And what happens if you're locked out and sent back to square one? If you're unlucky, your school closes because of a global pandemic. 90% of children around the world were locked out of school when COVID-19 struck. If you're lucky, you learn digital entrepreneurship and vocational skills. Training like this helps young people to develop their confidence and creativity. If you're unlucky, you're forced to flee your home to seek safety. More than half of the world's refugee children don't receive any education at all. If you're lucky, you attend a quality preschool. Early childhood education is vital. 90% of a child's brain is developed by the age of five. If you're really lucky, education will unlock your potential, giving you the best start in life, a safe place to learn, and the skills you need for the future. A quality education should never be a game of chance.
Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening, regardless of where you are in the world. My name is Jamira Burley. I'm the head of youth engagement and skills for the Global Business Coalition for Education. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to the Global Business Coalition for Education in their world event for the 75th annual General Assembly for the United Nations. As you all know, COVID-19 has forced all of us to go online to have these very serious discussions. And we're excited to welcome thousands from around the world to participate in how we can create solutions for change to enable young people around the world to get access to quality education. Before COVID-19, more than a half a billion young people were still out of school. After COVID-19, 1.5 billion young people were forced to leave their physical schools and take up education online if it was available. We're here today to discuss what are the solutions for change, how can we enable for government leaders, business leaders, and young people to be at the table to discuss solutions for how we can get every young person in school. Um, and we, this is why we're here today, to invite you into those discussions to have meaningful ways in which we can ensure that young people have access to education. So we'll have world leaders, business leaders, and young people participating in discussions throughout the day for about 20 minutes. Many of those discussions will lead into workout sessions. We invite all of you to be active participants in those discussions. Um, and with that being said, I have the pleasure of now introducing the United Nations Secretary General who will welcome us to today's program. Thank you, Jamira. And thank you to Their World and the Global Business Coalition for Education for hosting this event. And I applaud the governments, businesses, civil society representatives, foundations, and youth leaders who have come together to unlock big change in education. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been a year of unprecedented disruptions with some 1.5 billion students affected by school closures. One third of these will enable to access remote learning. As a new academic year begins in much of the world, two thirds of the global student population are not expected to attend classes. This situation will have a disproportionate impact on the most marginalized and vulnerable students, many of whom may never return to school. We cannot afford a lost generation. That is why we need to mobilize all those who can take action as we have done through the Global Education Coalition launched by UNESCO and the Save Our Future campaign to rally support for education responses to COVID-19. Because to rebuild from this pandemic, education is the key to unlocking the big change we need. Education can promote equality, create opportunities and jobs, and build lasting peace. Education is central to sustainable development and helps build resilience to future shocks. Today, I hope you all live with the ideas, inspirations, and actions you need to give every child to best start in life, a safe place to learn, and skills for the future. Thank you. So we have the European Commissioner, uh, who's the, uh, in, responsible for crisis management, Yanez Leznasik, with us today. We have Yasmin Sharif, who's the Director of Education Cannot Wait, Annemiek Hugenboom, who's the Country Director of the People's Coastal Lottery, one of the significant funders for, uh, in Greece, and Emmanuel Boo Milton from Sparkbox, who's a community organizer and activist in Louisiana. So I want to paint a picture of education in emergencies around the world and highlight what can be done at the policy level and the local level so that we know how we can make a difference at both ends. And in the process of this conversation, I hope we can also think about how we're developing a response plan specifically for refugees in Greece after the camp in Moria on the island of Lesbos was destroyed in a devastating fire just 10 days ago, leaving 13,000 refugees homeless. Now, let me start with Yasmin Sharif from Education Cannot Wait. Yasmin, how many refugee children around the world are there? Where are they from? And what is education like for them? Don't forget to unmute. Of course, I had to forget that. Thank you very much, Sarah. And it's my pleasure to be here today with you and this um, very distinguished um, panel. Well, there are 80 million 
displaced and refugees in total around the globe today, of whom 26 million are refugees and of whom half, 13 million are refugee children having crossed an international border. They come from Syria, Venezuela, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Myanmar. These are the main refugee generating countries. And they often flee to countries where the school system, the education system is already overstretched, such as Lebanon, Uganda, Colombia, or Pakistan. Uh, and they are facing massive challenges, girls in particular, especially girls for secondary school uh, uh, who are facing the biggest barriers to actually advance their education or even be included in education systems. On the practical front across the board for all the refugees and imagine you have fled across an international boundary, you arrive, you have no birth certificates, you have no ID card, uh, you, you arrive in an in a overstretched system, so the classrooms are overcrowded. There's no sanitation, no hygiene, and sufficient teaching materials and learning materials, and often also language uh, barriers. So for us, we are really honored and privileged to work with Dear World, the postcode lottery, especially on the Greek islands, but with all our partners, and because we have to move with speed, and that's what Education Cannot Wait does keep their education not from being disrupted, especially during COVID-19, and to make sure that they can continue multi-year uh, to remain at school and to learn uh, with quality. Now, you mentioned Greece. Let me turn to Anna Mead. You recently visited the camp in the Greek islands. We're there last year when we were all able to travel. You know, these beautiful islands are a place we normally go to vacation. But instead, you saw firsthand that refugee camp, a camp that's now been destroyed by fire. Can you share what you saw there? And unmute. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, thank you also, uh, Daryl's team, for uh, creating this wonderful platform uh, where we can discuss uh, unlocking big change. And I think key for big change is engagement and empathy, as us also is on both shores. And that's what you create. So when we went to Lesbos Island uh, and we visited Moria Camp, uh, we saw uh, uh, a situation which was uh, really uh, shocking for us. And we developed a big plan to uh, increase the facilities for education uh, from uh, then uh, maybe 10, 15% to at least uh, giving children, more than 4,000 children in the camp, the possibility to go to school uh, uh, nearby in a facility called Tapwa. We uh, also in April, uh, we were awaiting the opening of a second school there uh, and uh, that was when Corona struck uh, and uh, the school was closed. So uh, and that's like most schools in the world are closed uh, or they're even not there for refugee children. Uh, and now, as you said, Moria is no longer burnt to ashes. So I was lost for words when I saw the refugee families shaken and uh, afraid on the roadside. And here, I think, in Greece particular, our efforts for education for refugee children should dovetail with a more humane immigration policy. You know, divided migration policies result in appalling camp conditions, in many deaths on sea, in uh, violence, pushbacks at the borders of Europe, and uh, migrant families trapped uh, across the Greek island. And therefore, I think it's wonderful that we are together today, that Camp Moria, how sad uh, it is, uh, but that the fire igniting uh, a, a growing grassroots movement in Europe for a better policy. And it's heartwarming to see that uh, 180 German cities and states uh, have pledged to bring in more asylum seekers then their uh, national government quota allows them. For example, give you one example, the city of Potsdam is allowed to take in three, uh, but they have offered to take in 100. 
and uh, similar pledges came all across Europe from cities like Barcelona, Amsterdam, uh, Brugge. So uh, I would like us also uh, to join that uh, uh, pledge for uh, immigration, which helps to protect refugees, not exclude them. So um, you remember also the decision of Angela Merkel, uh, you know, to take in a million uh, refugees. And uh, I think uh, five years on, we have seen that uh, the refugee integration has been successful. So uh, there is, uh, if you give people the personal experience of meeting others, being part of doing something, then you will have a strong majority to support. Uh, and I think that we need, at the same time, complementary to a better and more humane immigration policy, we need education on the spot. That's where the migrant children are now. So together, we can be that force for good and for a greener, better future, focused on using children's talent and especially empowering girls. Thank you so much. Let me turn to the European Commissioner and thank you for joining us here today. You've recently taken over this portfolio at the uh, European Commission and you see what's happening on the shores in Greece, but also across in Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. Why are you making education one of your priorities? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, first of all, I strongly believe that uh, every child, every child deserves a better future. And uh, every child deserves security, a sense of normality, protection, and above all, an enabling space to develop skills and potential. And it is through education that every child can get this. Nelson Mandela said once, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. I would only add that education is also the most effective vehicle to empower individuals, to help them stand on their own feet. And all this applies even more to children who find themselves in emergency settings, who are victims of conflict, natural and other disasters, who find themselves in refugee and migrant camps, and who have, uh, who have been deprived of access to education. That's why the education in emergency has become an integral part of European Union humanitarian assistance for these reasons, because we are talking here about the most disadvantaged children, most disadvantaged young people, and they are at the heart of my mandate as a commissioner responsible for crisis management and humanitarian action. You mentioned Moria, uh, as uh, this is within the European Union, other parts of the Commission services are responsible for uh, assistance. However, through our Union civil protection mechanism, member states responded within hours to a request by Greek authorities for assistance. And over the days, more than 100,000 items were sent to Greece to help. Uh, to help uh, shelter the refugees who, be, who, who, who were left without uh, the roof under, under, uh, uh, above them, to uh, provide for food uh, and hygienic kits and so on. This is emergency assistance. But of course, more long-term solution is necessary. That's why the Commission will come up the day after tomorrow, on Wednesday, with its proposal for a genuine migration pact which should solve this kind of issues in a more sustainable manner based on solidarity and especially based on the protection of, of refugees and migrants. Thank you. Let me turn to Boo. Boo, you've responded to education and emergency situation in Louisiana. Um, can you explain a little bit about what you did at a community level with Sparkbox? Unmute. Sorry. Um, yeah, so uh, at heart, you know, I'm a, I, I love working with children. Um, you know, I'm, I volunteer at, a, at this particular summer camp every year. 
And uh, when I found out that the camp was canceled due to the pandemic, this crisis that, that, that we're going through, it really hit me uh, hard knowing that, you know, other kids and like everyone, you know, around the city, around the world uh, would be missing that development and education, that, that, that special development that happens, you know, over the summer at camp. So uh, what I did was I, I was thinking like, okay, how can I get that same experience to them? So I created uh, the Spark Box, which focuses on social emotional learning, and we have daily wellness check-ins within the box to help parents engage with conversations with their children, uh, really meaningful conversations around their mental wellness during a time such as this. So, you know, we have the education piece and the mental wellness piece that both work hand-in-hand -hand with this. Uh, to make it possible, and I connected with uh, local leaders, city government, to make it happen, and we've been able to distribute over 2,000 spark boxes within the city, so it's been great. It's been a huge impact, and I think there's so many lessons we can learn when we're able to share things globally, because problems accessing education are very similar wherever you are in the world. Let me come back around to you, Yasmin. Boo, of course, is right in there, uh, taking action, but do you see young people getting more engaged around the world? Unmute. Uh, it's very inspiring to be here together with you, uh, Bo, and, and of course also with <laughs> Commissioner Benacic and Animec. Uh, but to see young people going out and doing a difference, because you're the new generation that will change uh, the world and also be the voices. And, um, and I think this is, you see, the first responder in, in the middle of a crisis, when you have a crisis or an onset of a disaster, it's always the community. So it's a fallacy to think it's international community. It's really the community, the local community. And what we see there is the youth. It's the youth that take to the uh, to raise their voices uh, and speak up for education to protect it during the crisis. And not only do they speak up, they are also participating in designing the crisis response. What does need to go into that education investment? We see this for education cannot wait. They are part of shaping the investment that, that we are making in the middle of the crisis or response to the crisis. So I think this is very, very important. It's wonderful to see young men like you, Bo, but it's also when you see very strong adolescent girls uh, in Ethiopia, uh, in the Sahel, and they are the ones speaking up in the communities. There are two examples I would like to highlight where we have seen also how it led to results, very strong ones. Um, in UNRWA, you have a youth parliament where the youth are the advocates for education and many other development sectors in response to the crisis. But um, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, the youth advocates of the UNRWA parliament, they went out at a, at a global event and made a global campaign for integrating much stronger response to mental health and psychosocial services in the curriculum and in the education um, system delivered by UNRWA in Gaza, where it's needed more than ever. And as a result, they came out. I mean, they, they actually drew, drew a lot of attention globally and also financial support to make that change. So that's one example. UNICEF has also developed um, a very good example in the Middle East and Northern Africa, where they work with an inclusive process with the young people, the adolescents, to develop a curriculum that will help amplify the voices of youth. So the curriculum itself has, has been developed with the contributions of the youth and their leadership. And then the curriculum, the, 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 the skills that are being taught is to amplify the voices, to be the advocates, to speak up for the right to education. Uh, and I think these are skills that we need for the 21st century, it should be in every curriculum uh, so that the youth can run the world in a better place into a better place than we are right now, here and today. Thank you. Yasmin, I think at their world, we always say things need to change top down and bottom up. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a good uh, impression of what's coming up. If I can come back to you, Commissioner Lahasek, you're right there at the top. And the EU has led the way by making sure that 10% of its emergency aid does go to education. Will the EU continue to do its part? And how do we encourage other donors as well? Well, thank you. The reason uh, why uh, the EU decided to allocate a specific and substantial part of its, uh, in, in its uh, humanitarian assistance to education in emergency is best captured in the title of the organization that Yasmin leads, 
Education cannot wait. When you have children, boys and girls, young adults, in an emergency situation, in a refugee camp, uh, in um, other, part, other types of emergency settings, they traditionally have benefited from classical ways of humanitarian assistance, food, shelter, hygiene, water, medic, basic medical care. These are all important, no doubt about it. However, education should also be part of this because education, in my strong opinion, is a fundamental right of every child and young adult. So we cannot wait for situation to normalize, for peace to, to return or, or the like, and then invest in education. We have to invest right away because children must not miss their um, education. Uh, especially now when we see there is a ever more protect, protracted conflict, and some cases unfortunately mean that the children live throughout their educational cycle in an emergency setting. That's all that led us to decide that the European Union will allocate 10% of its emergency, of its humanitarian aid to emergency, uh, education in emergency. Um, and this is, in our view, essential investment, uh, so as to ensure that all children have access to quality education. And all should mean all, especially those that are in a difficult situation, those that are most vulnerable, who find themselves in emergency situations, in crisis, in conflicts, uh, who live in hard to reach areas or areas with fragile education uh, systems. I'm, I'm very proud that EU uh, has shown an example. I do hope that others will also follow the EU's example and allocate a substantial part of their humanitarian budget to this extremely important area, which is education in emergencies. Thank you, and thank you, Commissioner, for your leadership in this area. Now, I'm mindful the clock is ticking us, and I want to make sure we get everyone in. Anamik, the partnerships work when we have everyone involved, and you're a representative of the private sector as much as you are of the philanthropic side. How can the private sector get more involved in the way that the People's Postcode Lotteries have? Unmute. Yes, time. Uh, you know, is uh, we uh, as postcode lotteries, we are uh, an engaged, long-term, and flexible uh, partner uh, for many organizations who work in the world. And I guess that about uh, twenty percent of our funding is going to partners who work on education. Uh, we support thousands of community projects, and we do that long-term because you cannot build an education program or a successful NGO when your horizon is limited to one or two years. So long-term funding for us is key and for our players. Let me give you an example. We have uh, a few hundreds of our organizations working in Africa now. And for African girls, school closure is, is disastrous. Uh, uh, many girls uh, are uh, facing, uh, you know, child marriage, teenage pregnancy. Last week, I spoke to two young uh, community organizers in Kenya, uh, and they told us it ruins girls' lives. Girls who are dreaming of becoming a science teacher suddenly have, because the teacher is not inside, have been circumcised. And they estimate that two million more extra girls will be circumcised, have no chance for schooling anymore. Um, so there is an emergency in what looks like a regular situation because of 80% of African countries still having the school closed. So what can we do in that situation uh, to prevent that girls are no longer, uh, uh, are, are no longer just not seen? So uh, uh, we know of a number of our partners who visit uh, uh, communities to convince parents, elders, they shouldn't feel free to, to uh, marry their girls. Uh, and uh, they speak, they become radio stars, those young girls, uh, to, to speak to others, because radio is something which is quite accessible throughout Africa. So I love thinking big, and I love thinking that uh, we, you are a, a great example. Education Cannot Wait is a great example. So let's step up our efforts uh, and, 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 and uh, set 
everything we can in the face of adversity and help uh, together uh, to, uh, uh, to make the long voyage of refugees, children sensible and uh, uh, to keep uh, schools open. And I thought about one, one sentence, why not pushing uh, double or triple shift education also in Africa? In, in, in a more regular situation to prevent this disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, a lot to think about. Boo, as we reach the end of this session, I just want to challenge you to succinctly tell us what your message is for other young people out there who want to make a difference in their communities when education is disrupted. Unmute. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I would say, um, you know, I always tell people start with the heart. Um, you know, um, start with what you care about the, the most, because the most impactful change comes from the heart. And then think about impactful uh, ways, like like real innovative ways to get it done and find people to collaborate with, because collaboration is everything, because, you know, we're all responsible for this change. Um, and then, you know, lastly, uh, something I always say is, uh, whether you think the impact is huge or small, you know, something might be everything to somebody. So just give it to all, no matter how big or small you think it is. Thank you, Boo. Well, we're out of time, but what a great panel, what a great discussion. Now we're gonna pause here with a short video about refugees in Lebanon that we've made thanks to our partner, uh, their, the organization Skilled. And when we come back, we're gonna talk about skills for young people. Thank you. عنده كتير حركة عنده حب التعلم سوريا ما في ما في تعليم نتيجة الحرب شاف النار شاف المعاملة السيئة شاف القتل نحن على الأولاد يلي موجودين إنه معقول تكون هاي البيئة اللي هن عايشين فيها بيفكروا بأسس ما بيفكرها ولد بعمرهم في كتير أولاد يمكن ما كان عندهم مشاكل جوس لأنه أنهم متعرفين على هاي دول الأسس أو الماتيريالز أو يمكن أول مرة بيشوفوا كتاب هيدول الاكسرسايزز فينا نعملهم بيخلونا نحدد مثلا هيدا الولد وين نقطة قوته وين اكثر شيء بيعرف وين ناقصه شغل بين التغيير واضح من الدورة اللي عملناها الاكيب اللي عم يشتغل معنا انه كثير لاحظوا الفرق مع الولاد عندي نظرة مستقبلية ممكن يطلع منه شيء هالوقت وهيدا حق أبسط حقوق الطفل أنه يتعلم